Welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. My name is Brian Gigantino. Ronald Grigor Suni's decades-long career as a historian transformed the historiography of the Soviet Union. One of the ways this was done was by centering the nation and nationality as prisms through which the entire Soviet structure and Soviet history could be understood. In particular, Suni did this with special attention to the South Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and of course, Georgia. Suni's analysis focused on how nationhood is a constructed product of history and is imagined, not a primordial, essential ethnic community. Suni's newest book, Stalin, Passage to Revolution, is a look at the early part of Joseph Stalin's life in the years leading up to the 1917 Russian Revolution. Suni's book interrogates the world that made Stalin, early 20th century social democracy in the South Caucasus the multinational movement and milieus of Baku, Tiflis, and Batumi, in which the young seminarian from Gori, Soso Jugashvili, will politically mature through writing articles, planning expropriations, and organizing workers, becoming the revolutionary Marxist and Bolshevik Joseph Stalin. On today's episode, myself and Sopo Japaridze interview historian Ronald Grigor Suni to discuss his new book, Stalin, Passage to Revolution, social democracy in Georgia, and Soviet history, and more. We here at Reimagining Soviet Georgia held a reading group on the book, so we also invited our friend, comrade, and fellow reading group member Julia Damphouse on for a conversation. Julia is a member of the editorial board for the English language translation of the complete works of Rosa Luxemburg and reading groups coordinator at Jacobin Magazine. Immediately following the Sunni interview, Sopo and Julia discuss their reflections on the book and why it is worth the 700-page undertaking. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today on Reimagining Soviet Georgia. So first, I just want to ask, why did you write your book, Stalin, Passage to Revolution? That's not difficult to answer. First of all, I've been studying the Caucasus, the South Caucasus, what we used to call Transcaucasia, for over half a century. And uh, I wanted to get people interested and read this complex area and understand it. I had spent a lot of time learning the languages of the region. I am Armenian myself, born in America, but uh, my parents didn't speak to us in Armenian, so I had to learn Armenian as a foreign language in graduate school. And then later uh, in Tbilisi, in the 1970s, a couple times I learned, started studying Georgian, which isn't the easiest thing to know. You may know that, Brian. I'm not sure. Zalia Zinelia. Oh, your accent's so good. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm studying Turkish, so I mix up everything, you know. So if I, if I tried <laughs> to say, you know, Matloba, I would come out Teşekkür ederim or something like that. So every language gets mixed up. But anyway... I I invested a huge amount of energy, time, uh, and so forth in studying the area and writing these books. You know, the first book was the Baku Commune on Azerbaijan, the revolution, then the making of the Georgian nation, which was not very well received in Georgia. But then none of my books are well received wherever I write. And wait, can you explain, wait, Ron, can you explain why was your book, uh, The Making of the Georgian Nation, not received well in Georgia? So it came out in Soviet times, and there was great resistance. The book is, uh, you know, written by an Armenian, and there has always been sort of friction or tension between Armenians and Georgians, at least in the mind of nationalists, at least. Then there was, you know, he's a Westerner. What does he know? And he's also a left winger. He's a anti-nationalist, and he's a Marxist of some kind. So all of these things, I think, made it complex. And then the argument of the book, 
the argument of the book was that nations are human creations. They're not facts of nature. And that whatever Georgia was through its history, uh, it was something different in modern times. So it's the making of modern Georgia, really. And that's when nations are made in the 18th to 20th century or something like that. And that was a relatively radical critique at the time. Uh, I received the same, by the way, uh, uh, blowback and resistance on a book written, uh, I think, in 1993 about, called Looking Toward Ararat, Armenian Modern History, because I also argued that Armenians, like every nation, were a creation in terms of what nation is in modern times. Not that there weren't Georgians or some kind of state or some kind of culture, but what we mean by nation, which has a very specific meaning to me, it's it's a group of people that imagines that because of their culture, because of language, religion, whatever, they have the right to political rights, autonomy, statehood, territory, etc. That particular combination, which brings culture together with politics, is a relatively modern notion, maybe from the late 18th century, French Revolution on. I'm writing a book about that now called Forging the Nation, the Making and Faking of Nationalisms. So you can imagine in a country like Georgia, where there's a struggle uh, to keep your identity, to fight against Sovietization or Russification uh, or eventually independence, that to make such a radical th thesis and tell people, no, 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 you're, you're really an imagined community. You're, this is something that is, is more subjective. You don't really exist. <laughs> yeah. You do exist because all communities are only imagined. And it's how people create that. Now, it's imagined as real and so real that people are ready to die, kill, and sacrifice families and wealth and everything for it. So that that's simply a constructivist rather than what we call a primordialist idea of the nation. And that was too radical for people in the Caucasus where they were struggling, you know, to maintain themselves. The famous Czech writer Milan Kundera said, a small nation can disappear and knows it. So Georgians, Armenians, and others have that sense of danger that we've been colonized, we've been invaded, uh, we've been threatened. Do you think of the time of, uh, you know, Erikle Meore, you think of uh, Erikle the II, that's a time when Georgia was practically annihilated, you know, or when the Armenians suffered a genocide in 1915. So th there's a real, there's a real threat to small nations. Now, ironically, Russians also think that <laughs> they're threatened and could be eliminated. So great nations also have these anxieties. Even Americans think, you know, oh my goodness, if we allow homosexuality and feminism and critical Marxism to flourish, oh, what will happen to America? So these are right-wing conservative ideas and they're very powerful. I'm curious though, like, so then uh, to coming back to the Stalin book, so what then drove you to want to write about Stalin's early years? After your studies of Transcaucasia, what drove you to specifically want to write about Stalin? So Stalin was the gimmick, the means to get people to pay attention to the Caucasus because he's known. No one, if I say Georgia in America, they think I'm talking about Atlanta, not Tbilisi, right? So, so, uh, and, and if you say Armenian, they think you're, what is that, Australian or Austrian? What, what is it? I mean, Americans are geographically blind. They don't know about the, they know very little history. They're kind of geschichtlos of people, you know, they're historyless people. So, so you do your best and you try to write interestingly about these strange places, at least not strange to you and me, but strange to Americans. And then the other thing is, I uh, consider myself a Marxist in some sense. That is, I'm highly influenced by, by, by a particular view of history, a critique of capitalism, an aspiration that we might do better and create something more democratic called socialism and so forth. And because of that, I wanted to re-examine uh, Russian and Georgian social democracy. I'm very much an admirer of Russian and Georgian social democracy, Georgian Menshevism, Russian Bolshevism. And those histories have been misrepresented, distorted in America. 
So I wanted to write about it. And Stalin, again, was the gimmick, was the MacGuffin, MacGuffin, they say, you know, the way of getting to that particular topic. Yeah. Um, what? Well, one thing I know um, is that most people are not going to take the time to read the 800 page book, especially not Georgians in English, <laughs> unless they really care not to say not to not to, you know, say that your work is not valued because it's a beautiful book. You know, I, I highly recommend everyone to read it. But knowing, you know, the most people have said that English is something they're not really reading, like like Georgian scholars are not really reading things in English so much. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what kind of criticism could be coming your way. You know, like what are, have you talked to any Georgian um, academics or people who either read or pretended to read your book? What have they said to you about it? Like how was it received? Oh, I worked with several Georgian uh, academics, and uh, they were uh, extremely helpful in my uh, in my work. I, I don't think I could have completed this work uh, as well without them. Uh, so I uh, I had it read by them, uh, crit- criticized all the as much as possible uh, the Georgian words and names and everything all accurately reproduce. It's, it's uh, you know, that, that was indispensable. Uh, and they helped me enormously. Uh, and uh, I, you know, spent a lot of time in Georgia. My first time in Georgia was 1964 or 65. So I've been going back and forth a lot of time. Uh, and um, the, I have not yet received criticism of the kind I got with my first book. Um, I think Georgia has changed uh, and Georgian scholarship has become more sophisticated and more interested in Western approaches. Uh, there is a, a struggle always in Transcaucasia or in South Caucasus between more nationalist approaches and more scholarly approaches. So uh, I hope this book will be translated into Georgian and there's some talk about doing that. We'll see. The only thing I think I have in Georgian is one chapter of the making of the Georgian nation uh, on Stalinism. What can Stalin tell us about Georgian social democracy or the history of socialism in Georgia? In that book, I tried not only to reproduce the history of Stalin himself, that is his trajectory, his transformation from a young uh, provincial boy in seminaries, training to be a priest, a romantic poet, a Georgian nationalist, a bulbuli, a a boy with a beautiful singing voice, uh, idealistic in in certain ways, how that figure transformed over time into the much more ruthless, Machiavellian, instrumentalist uh, revolutionary that he became. And that's sort of the arc of the book. And I guess one of the things that it tells us is that many people, particularly in the Bolshevik wing of social democracy, but also in the Mensheviks, I I show in the book that Mensheviks and Bolsheviks are not that different. They're all revolutionaries. They all understand that if you're going to change society, the people who are in power with property and privilege are not going to give it up without a fight. So violence may be in the cards, right? But Mensheviks were more kind of oriented to moderate policies, toward slower route to socialism, toward less violence. Not always. They also uh, had terrorist groups of various kinds, as did Stalin. Uh, But the Bolsheviks themselves were a group of people following Lenin who recognized that revolutionary politics is a kind of warfare, class warfare, if you like but that it's not about negotiation and compromise and deliberation like democratic politics. It's basically conquer and destroy, if possible, your enemy and move on from there. And that idea of politics as war, which develops in the book, you notice, and and that Stalin carries out, Lenin it certainly does, um, that becomes the nature of Bolshevik politics after the, after the revolution when they come to power. You know, I, another thing that um, I really appreciated about the book uh, 
was the way that you were able to sort of intertwine intellectually and politically and socially an empire-wide Russian social democracy and a local milieu in Tiflis, in Batumi, in Georgia, and in the caucus um, as a whole, you know, Baku, Georgian Bolsheviks operating in Baku, having interaction with uh, social Democrats in Tiflis, in Petrograd, and all over. And so uh, I'm curious if you could talk about what role did Georgian social democracy have in the empire-wide uh, Russian social democratic movement? And how would you say the Russian social democratic movement played a role in the local Georgian social democratic movement? In the 1890s, uh, the dominant movements, let's say at the beginning of the 90s in Georgia, political movements, were a kind of aristocratic nationalism. You could say that that was associated with, the major figure would be Ilya Chapjavadze, the poet, very important national figure, um, and maybe some populist groups, liberal groups, and so forth. But when Noria Georgiania came back from Poland, when they begin to publish, when the, the so-called third generation or third group, Mesamadasi, uh, forms um, as a Marxist group, when they, they then uh, eventually take over the uh, newspaper Kvali, uh, when this happens, suddenly Marxism, a particular Marxism, very much the product of Jordania and his close comrades, became the National Liberation Movement of Georgia. And it's so interesting because instead of saying, as Chapjavadze did, uh, we're against Armenians, there's a very uh, harsh uh, uh, book that Chapjavadze wrote uh, against Armenians, uh, or that we're against Russians, uh, the, uh, the, the Marxists, the, 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 the Mesemadas, they said, no, we're against not Russians, but autocracy, against officialdom, against the repression of the empire. We're not against Armenians. We're against the bourgeoisie. We want to move beyond capitalism because the Armenians made up much of the middle class in uh, Tbilisi and in, in other cities like Baku and so forth. So this, this way of using Marxism to define a new approach to history and uh, sociology of Georgia was quite radical. And what's so surprising, it resonated. It resonated with the intelligentsia. It resonated with the working class. And most surprisingly, eventually, um, with some resistance on the part of the intellectual leaders, it resonated with the peasants of Guria, of Mingrelia, of Western Georgia. The interesting thing is, so the Georgian peasants in the Western part of the country had revolted already beginning at the beginning of the 20th century, 1902, 3, 4. And then eventually... The, uh, the Marxists join that movement and begin to lead it. And Georgian Menshevism, unlike Russian Menshevism or even Russian Bolshevism, had a mass following. And so when after 1905, you have elections to the Duma, the various parliaments, right, that go from 1906 to 1917, the Georgian Mensheviks had mass support. They won elections. They became the leaders of the social democratic faction within the Dumas, right? The second Duma, they were very powerful. And the leader there, Irakli Tzedetelli, was ar arrested and went to Siberia until the revolution liberated him. So this was extraordinarily important. So Mensheviks, but not Russian Mensheviks so much who were anti-peasant, but Georgian Mensheviks with this, this worker intelligentsia and peasant support became a very important uh, faction within the Russian Social Democratic Party. I was actually surprised. Um, well, actually, not surprised. I think it became very clear to me while reading this book why Menshevism was just way more dominant than Bolshevism, despite the, um, all, you know, sending all the the Mensheviks and like taking over, you know, all, one by one all the committees and stuff. <laughs> besides all the manipulative rubbish happening and maneuvering. Um, the real politic and that uh, was also because they really did take on so many of the Russian Bolshevik stuff that there was almost no need for Bolsheviks because the Mensheviks had sort of uh, taken on a lot of those characteristics that defined Russian Bolsheviks. And so I was like, oh, that makes sense because then 
because it was it was like strange why say Menshevism was so dominant here right. and yet not very popular in Russia. And it's like oh, because they weren't like Mensheviks really. You know, there was sort of some kind of you know between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. <laughs> the most the most like, Bolshevik of the what Mensheviks. They call Trotsky, yeah. you know, between Menshevism and Bolshevism, it's right. like that. You know? <laughs> yeah, the most Bolshevik of the Mensheviks. Yeah, that's what Lenin said. I, or at least that's what what he thought. Yeah, and also I think uh, the prestige of Jordania. And that Mesamadasi group was very important uh, because once he became Menshevik and he comes back to Georgia in 1905, he wins people over pretty quickly. And the message he brings is uh, he, of course, I think in a way misreads uh, uh, what Lenin was about. But he says, basically, they want to dominate you, these intellectuals. They want to control you. And we want a worker based uh, movement. Right now. As you mentioned, the difference between Menshevism and Bolshevism is very slight and often flexible. It moves back and forth. But nevertheless, that message resonated. Uh, Georgian workers uh, were quite conscious. They were well organized. They were literate. And, uh, and then, of course, with the support of this peasant movement, the Mensheviks quickly take over. And the Bolsheviks are so isolated that Stalin leaves Georgia. And he goes to Baku, where at least there's among the oil workers and factory workers, there's more support for the Bolshevik movement. And why did Stalin choose Bolshevism? There, Lenin is important. Lenin elevated the role of direction and influence and propaganda of the social democrats, of those revolutionaries in the party. And he was particularly looking not only for intellectuals, certainly not particularly intellectuals, but what you might call worker intellectuals those who come from the working class. And Stalin, of course, was the son of a shoemaker, a cobbler. And, Le and he was just what Lenin was looking for. And so there you get a worker uh, intelligent, a rabochi intelligent, and that guy uh, is elevated by Lenin. Lenin makes Stalin's career, bringing him into the center, putting him in the central committee. Lenin also liked another worker Bolshevik, a guy named Roman Malinovsky, who you know because you read the book, turned out to be a police spy. So right there next to Stalin, in the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, after 1912, is a police spy, who, of course, in 1913, fingers Stalin and has him arrested at a party, and he spends the next four years in exile in Siberia. Hmm. Well, you know, what's interesting is there's a uh, sentiments. It's like, you know, post-communist Georgia is very anti-communist, anti-Marxist, anti-socialist, anti-everything, right? Besides like a very far-right um, nationalism. And of course, this obsession of Chavch Awadze as being some kind of a, a god almost. He's a saint, isn't he? So, yeah, probably. <laughs> He's been canonized <laughs> by the church. That's what, the, that's what usually the next step is. <laughs> um, but like, uh, what in his like on the bus stops, you know, you have quotes from job jobs. I mean, it's, it's really it's aggravating for me. But um, what and there has been like a small part um, where people are now trying to learn more about the First Republic and Menshevism and Jordania, and they're trying to sort of create reconstruct this idea of what was the First Republic like. Except in reality, I've never met, seen them mention anything about socialism or <laughs> Marxism, or they do mention it in this like passing way. Like, like this one woman in the archive said, oh, that's just what it was at the time. Any, anybody could have, you know, made Georgia independent. It was just like, they just happened to be mm -hmm. popular at the time, you know, like right. very dismissive of their entire program. And so, and also this obsession with Jav Jawadze, the fact that, you know, one of my favorite things about Jordania and, and, and and Mensheviks is that they were very anti-nationalist, you know, like this kind of um, aristocratic kind of nationalism. They were very much directly confronting it. And so that's all lost. And there's this like pretty story about of just being like independent away from Russia. Right. That's like what's what's in people's like, That's how it, like at the end is what you get, you know, like they're the, if you distill their their talking points. Um, and so it's interesting that everyone's sort of going back to that. But like when you take Stalin, it's a little harder to avoid the socialist program <laughs> like you can with Menshevism. Even though I don't know how they can, but they somehow do it, you know? And so it's interesting, your book, 
even though I think he does like a better job of laying the groundwork showing what was happening from all sides and the revolutionary movement is a lot more fair and actually more interesting and like riveting, by the way, reading a book, it's like page turner. You're like, what's going to happen next? You know, it's such <laughs> an exciting time. So like, I think like it, it's interesting because there's like a whole thing about going back to Menshevism and, and opening that up, but your book is, is not, it's Stalin. So how do you see yourself or do you know about any other work that's coming out about Menshevism and how do you talk to how, or how would you talk to young scholars in Georgia about that? So a couple of years ago, uh, I was in Georgia and we had a wonderful conference on the, um, uh, on, on the um, uh, First Republic and on the Menshevik movement. And uh, my friend Becca Kobachidze uh, and some of his close comrades and people of working are trying to resurrect that history because Georgians should be rightly proud of it. It was an extraordinary movement, far more democratic than Leninist Bolshevism. It, it, it ruled the republic from May 1918 until the Red Army came in in February 1921. Uh, it was highly respected in the West. You know, Karl Kautsky came to Georgia to praise this peasant republic. Now, they were very practical uh, Marxists, and they believed appropriately that it wasn't time to build, you know, Marxist socialism in Georgia. It was a largely peasant country. And therefore, they were creating a democratic republic, a more bourgeois liberal republic, but they were socialist leaders, etc. Uh, and they they did use, of course, they were state politicians and Marxists. They did use violence uh, to keep the state together. They fought the whites. Uh, they fought the Ossetines. They fought the Abkhaz because Abkhaz and Ossetines were more uh, Bolshevik than, than the majority of Georgians. So some of the things that eventually come out later in the 90s already are pre-visioned in some of the policies. So the Mensheviks were not that soft. I mean, they were practical politicians. They did what was necessary to hold power, etc. But they had an advantage over Lenin and the Bolsheviks in Russia because they had majority support. So they could afford to be more democratic. Lenin never had majority support. Maybe in the city of Tbilisi, uh, in Petrograd, in November, October, November 1917, they had support among workers and soldiers, but never majority support. And they had to conquer the country through the Civil War. Uh, and they used military might, terror, persuasion, propaganda, uh, effective policies to eventually do that. But Jordania and the Mensheviks did have popular support. They were they were the party of, of national liberation uh, in Georgia, and they were able to carry on more or less a democratic policy. You know, your book is interesting because it also uh, very clearly takes Stalin seriously as a Marxist. Right. And that's yeah. an, a theme in your book that I think, you know, us coming from the left um, was very refreshing and interesting to see because you historically situate the development of Stalin as a Marxist, which I think both Cold War historians and the left had actually agreed that was not a useful thing to do. But what you your book does is says it actually is useful to understand how and why Stalin, who would end up, you know, leading the Soviet Union for a very long time and play a role in the development of particular policies early on, should be taken seriously as a Marxist. And so um, I'm curious what you think about that or if you have any thoughts on that. And also like how you put the, the slanderous quotes before... <laughs> Right. Before the chapter. Yeah, you put the slanderous <laughs> quotes at the beginning, and then you have the chapters yeah. that sort of relate that's incorrect, incorrect like, yeah. or show why those slanderous quotes are incorrect. That was I also thought that so was some of the quotes are slanderous. Some are praiseworthy. That is, there's a kind of the the book is a kind of in a funny way postmodern uh, narrative because it's trying to show the many sidedness of Stalin and the way he's pictured. So you know you got to use the sources you have, and they're all engaged in some way. They're all, you know, leaning one way or another, and you have to play that. So I wanted to put those things there. Yes, some of the earlier biographies of the young Stalin, let's say Simon Sabag Montefiore's book, Young Stalin, or even Stephen Kotkin's very good book, uh, the first volume on, on the early Stalin, uh, 
they didn't take uh, him seriously as a Marxist. For uh, Montefiore, he's a bandit. He's a womanizer. He's a pedophile. Um, he's a gangster. He's a bank robber. Uh, but he's not. Uh, they, he doesn't discuss his nationality writings. He doesn't discuss the intricacies of Marxism. So th that was one of the purposes of this book was to try to recreate all, all of those things, right, that, that I think had been lost. And to put him in that context, this is where he lived. This is what his mind was concerned about. I'm admiring the two of you for having read the whole book and have gone through and you've, you've clearly read it carefully. The, the point is, uh, I spend a lot of time on the intricacies of the movement, on the labor movement, on 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 um, uh, the Marxist controversies, etc. I take them very seriously, almost too seriously. I would advocate if people aren't so interested in that, skim those parts, even though I find them fascinating, and go to the parts that you're you're interested in. But I'm trying to show how seriously he was engaged in those debates and all. And didn't always agree with Lenin. Lenin was very concerned with philosophical issues about materialism. Stalin said, that's a waste of time. Uh, what are you doing? It turns out Stalin was more for party unity and didn't want throwing people out of the party the way uh, Lenin was ready to do. Um, and, and was more in, in a funny way. And this is strange when you think of what Stalin did later, where he basically murdered the old Bolshevik elite in the 1930s. Uh, you, you wonder... How, how, uh, how, why was he so much for party unity in, in the pre revolutionary period? But it's there. That's what the sources show. You know, like um, reading Stalin, because I'm a union organizer here, um, <laughs> like his struggles, first of all, he's an amazing worker organizer, um, which is never, he just never really put, like they always talk about how he's a bandit and like was mostly like stealing, right? They never actually show him as a union organizer, somebody who's like incredible leader. So that was really refreshing to see. But also this, I totally understand this moment where he's like, you know, he's not a worker per se, cause he's, you know, an in, 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 intellectual, right? But he's also not the exiled intellectual, you know, philosophers like Lenin and so on. So he's sort of like in between where he's having a hard time really finding people who are just like him because anybody who sort of gets Marxism, what they do is they often leave, right? They, they go into exile. They write books. They spend all their time writing about theory. He stays all the time doing sort of the grunt work. I think that's incredibly impressive. Like most people, if he, he reached a certain level, but he didn't have to do that, I feel like. But he does do that. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. I like, what, I like your phrase, grunt work. That's very good. So the other day I gave an interview somewhere or gave a talk, and the criti critic said, one of the things uh, you could emphasize more, or you don't emphasize, but you found it there. Um, one of the things you can, you can emphasize more is what we call in America the ground game. So the ground game is exactly what you're doing professionally, right? Going out, talking to people, knocking on doors, whatever, when you want to win an election or you want to convert people, right? And Stalin was involved in that grunt work or ground game. Uh, he was down, down there. Uh, he did do union work in Baku in particular. Now, he also was hunted by the police. He was an outlaw. I use that word several times in the book. He was an outlaw. He had to be careful. He he was a committee man. He worked underground, you know, secretly. He was involved in what we call in Russian conspiracia, secret work, you know, because he would be arrested. And he was arrested several times in exile and finally uh, uh, for four years almost uh, at the end of end of the, the czarist period. So that's really, really important. And I think that's a good thing to say. He was not a great theorist. His most famous book, Marxism and the National Question, is basically a reprise of Lenin's views on the national question. It's very competent. What Stalin was good at was taking complex things like the Bolshevik-Menshevik split and explaining it clearly to ordinary people, right? And that's, that's good for a politician, you know, to simplify and make it that way. He was good at that. He was not a great orator. Especially later, he, he begins to speak in Russian with a heavy Georgian accent, but he was effective because he spoke simply, he repeated things, uh, and, and, and uh, from a position of power, he could, he could certainly convince people 
uh, of what, what he wanted and what they had to do. So tell me a bit about your project, Reimagining Soviet Georgia. Uh, that's exactly what I tried to do in the making of the Georgian nation. Yes. Yes. We, we're both, both of us also love your book, uh, Making of the Georgian Nation. That was, that was, as I said, heavily criticized. And two years ago or so, when I was last in Georgia, I wandered in into uh, Prospero. Is it Prospero? The bookstore on on, uh, on Rustavelli? And uh, I asked for the book and she said, well, we don't have copies less left. And uh, and then I, I left, I was leaving. And the owner of the store, a woman, ran after me and said, why did you ask about that book? I said, well, I wrote that book. And she said, oh, come in. I want to talk to you. And so we talked for a while. And then she had me write up a little thing, why I wrote that book. Have you ever seen that? I'll send it to you if you don't have it. All right. I'll send it to your email after this. Uh, why I wrote that book. And uh, uh, you can you can use that in any way you like. Yeah. Well, the 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 project that we started is basically a exactly what it sounds like an attempt to kind of reimagine, rearticulate, and re-engage with the Soviet past because of the how vicious the anti-Soviet, anti-socialist mm -hmm. memory politics are in Georgia, especially uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And as we were talking about, can't even really engage with the socialist content about the First Republic, let alone the Soviet period. So both Sopo and I have had lots of experiences here where um, most normal people, workers, older people who lived through the Soviet Union tell us that it was better. The 90s were worse. You know, they have a lot of fond memories of the Soviet Union. Academics tend to assess those people and say that they're just nostalgic or backwards or won't modernize. But what we're trying to do is actually close the gap between the reality of the Soviet period, people's real lived experiences as a way for people, especially on the left, to be able to have a ground upon which they can talk realistically about the socialist experience and maybe a socialist future. You know? Oh, that's great. Sure, that's noble work. I feel like people are being gaslighted here. I don't know how else to say this word, but like people are afraid to speak the truth about the Soviet Union, uh, that they liked it, you know, because it's like they've been told constantly on TV, they're hounded, you know, it's all they did with this year was go and like paint over Stalin statues and like put paint all over it, you know, you and know, like or, smash or like, it. Or like another thing is like the way that the Soviet Union gets instrumentalized in contemporary politics. The opposition, for example, uh, against Bidzina Ivanashvili, who is of course an oligarch and you know, a terrible politician, but then the opposition will put out a thing that says never back to the USSR, associating him with Russia and Russia is the Soviet Union and therefore. And so there's no room to have discourse about the real past. And what you're doing is is very good and, and noble, and it's good historical work, and you should continue. You you realize the dangerous minefield through which you're walking, because on the one hand, you want to do good history. That's important. On the other hand, you don't want to be a apologetic, because there were horrors in the Soviet Union, and Georgia suffered from them. Think about Tabidza and so forth. You know, there were terrible things that Stalin did. He's a Georgian, but he did terrible things, and to Georgia as well. So uh, I, my, in my whole career, I've been doing this half a century already, more, uh, I have to maneuver that way. And so there were achievements, there were good things. It was the Soviet Union and the Red Army that defeated fascism and ended the Holocaust, etc. They industrialized the country in a kind of slipshod way, maybe, but they made it a modern country. But at the same time, there were these excesses that actually debilitated the country. You know, Stalin in some ways was the grave digger of the original impulses, which are democratic socialists uh, of the revolution of 1917. And that, in other words, you'd have to create a much more complicated picture. And what your, your opponents will do is radically simplify it, you know, in a negative way. And you can't just radically simplify it in a positive way, obviously. It won't work because people know these various things and people seriously suffered during that period as well. Like the the suffering that happens now, um, it, you, can, you know, Soviet Union by almost every indicator was much better, right? In everyday life. After Stalin, right? I mean, you- After you, Stalin, yeah, 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 is, yeah after because, Stalin. Yeah, and that was a long period, almost 40 years. And, and 
no one is saying, let's go back to Stalinism. They're saying there were things from after Stalin. You know, my, my view of Soviet history is it was improvisational. Uh, Marx didn't help. Uh, he never wrote about socialism, what it would be like. He wrote about capitalism. He has the most brilliant critique of capitalism and the history of capitalism. But he didn't write much about socialism. So the Bolsheviks take power in a largely peasant country. And they're supposed to be a Marxist party and create socialism. The international revolution that Lenin bet on didn't happen. So Russia and the Soviet Union are left by themselves. Now they have to build up this country, right? Uh, and for willy-nilly, they, they do a lot of things. They industrialize it. They modernize it. They urbanize it. A country that was 80% peasant by 1960s, 70s, 80s is 80% urban and workers and intellectuals, highly educated population, still is. There's rights and development of national culture. That should be emphasized. How often we forget. Okay, there's, you know, Tabidze and so forth, but there's also Gamsa Khurdia, the old, the Konstantin, and others. There's a development of Georgian culture, Georgian film. Oh my God, what an achievement. Georgian literature uh, and poetry and music and all of that stuff. So there was that, and, and it's this complex, very variegated portrait that you have to get. So it's not doesn't become apologetic, but it also represent shows what the you know the Russian word, I don't remember the Georgian word is dostigenia, the achievements. Do you have any memories of your experience visiting Georgia in the Soviet period? Yeah, I'll tell you that. Well, first of all, you have to understand I loved the Soviet Union. I loved being there, I loved the people, I at one point had a lovely girlfriend there. Um, I, later, I traveled there with my wife, Armina. I lost my wife eight years ago. She was Armenian-American, but she would go with me. She, she was a pianist and a musician, and she worked at the conservatory in Tbilisi up on the hill and um, collected Georgian music and knew a lot about it, knew all those people. So we were very involved. And my father, of course, uh, uh, Gurken Suni, George Suni, was from Tbilisi. And they lived on what was called uh, Bebedovskaya Ulitsa, Ulitsa Bebedov. Uh, and it's, then it was Ulitsa Engelza. And it's the last street before the mountain and the Botanichiski Sad, the botanical garden. I think it's now named after a Georgian poet. Uh, I can't remember Adamiani or something like that. I mean, but but and that they lived there. I found the courtyard where they lived. I took my father there. Uh, there's a school down on that same street as you're going toward Maidan. And there's a school there that was an Armenian school. My grandmother taught mathematics there. My grandfather was the dirigeur of the uh, Kazioni Theater, the main theater. It would now be the Rustaveli Theater, right there on, on uh, Rustaveli, uh, you know, street. So it, it was, it was very much, uh, uh, you know, those things were very real, and um, uh, I loved it. I studied Georgian there with uh, various people. I had a wonderful teacher, uh, uh, who was a great guy, and we'd study Georgian in the morning. And then like a young Georgian male, he said, okay, that's enough. Now let's go drink. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, I can't. Uh, uh, I can't do that. John Dometrevelli was his name. And don't, I can't do that. I have to go to the library now and do my work and so forth. But he was always very disappointed. But I learned Georgian. <laughs> and later when I came back and learned and studied again with, with a wonderful linguist, Nia Abisadze, uh, who was really an expert in Mingrelian and 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 so forth, but and Svan, Svanudi. So um, so I I I I learned all the grammar. I knew the grammar perfectly. I could conjugate every verb, decline every noun, but I never learned to say pass the salt. You know, in other words, I learned it from books and linguists rather than from from people. Uh, that that could have taught me to speak it, but I did have good Georgian, and I could speak, and I could certainly read, and I read those newspapers in what was then the Karl Marx Library. It's now the State Library, uh, you know, Burzola, uh, 
and uh, Ertoba and uh, all of those wonderful, you know, newspapers of the time. And I would be reading these social democratic and newspapers and poor Georgian scholars would come over to me and look and see, and they weren't given those newspapers. They were in the Spetschran, the special uh, Adelenia, you know, the special closed areas of the library. They gave it to a foreign scholar who cared, but they wouldn't give it to these poor Georgian scholars who are Soviets. You know, I mean, I loved the Soviet Union, but the system was crazy. It was, you know, Gigi. It was uh, <laughs> crazy. Wait, did you notice, actually, I'm curious, did you notice any differences between, say, doing some of the scholarly work in the Soviet Union in Tbilisi versus, say, in Moscow or in Leningrad? Yeah, I got better access in the library to to things than I did in Moscow. In Tbilisi. But I, 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 yeah, in, in Tbilisi than in Moscow. But I did get into archives in Moscow. They didn't give me much until the Soviet Union collapsed. But I did, um, I never got into Georgian archives. They kept saying, we are, we are still unsecreting them. Rasekretovanya, they called it, you know, Rasekretovanya. Yeah. And so I never, every day I would call the archive and every day they would tell me that. Then after, and that's why the book took 30 years, because I put it aside and I waited for the, the thing to open. And, and then the Soviet Union collapsed and the Institute of Marxism Leninism, which is right there on Rustaveli, I don't know what it is now, probably a hotel or something. Uh, the archives of the Georgian party, this is the, the essence of Georgian Soviet history, was in the basement getting wet, moldy, and disintegrating. And two of my friends, Georgi Kudyashvili and Levon Avalishvili, young historians at the time, they saved that archive. And they made an agreement with... Um, uh, I'm forgetting everybody's name, but with a head of the, uh, somebody in the, in the police, in the Ministry of Otar, Tushi Shafili or something. I can't remember all these names right now. Uh, and they, together they saved the archives. They cleaned it. They dried it. And they put it in the building where it is now. And I was the first person to officially go there and work in that archive. Um, Montefiore had gotten materials from them. He, he didn't know Georgian or Russian, so he they were read and translated for him. But I went into the archives and with help, I read the documents. We looked at Stalin's mother's memoirs and we published it in Georgian, in Russian, and even in English. I wrote an introduction. So uh, it was an exciting time. And, and that book is based on all of those archives and so forth. Yeah. Julia, thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to read this 700 to 800 page book with us? Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, historical work is uh, that I um, I'm on the editorial sort of collective for the complete uh, works of Rosa Luxemburg translation into English. So I'm basically very interested in this first period of this whole first period that basically is covered by this biography of Stalin. So I think like, I don't know, I think one thing that he didn't that you guys didn't really get to talk about too much, or you tried to get him to talk about it a little bit was um, various like criticisms of the book or like ways that people sort of took it. And I think it has mainly positive reviews and I think rightly. Um, but I think one uh, interesting comparison or kind of point that I would definitely make is um, he does a lot in this final chapter of the book. Uh, and I really recommend people actually read this, even if you're not interested in reading the book itself, um, where he kind of does a mass review of like every other biography of Stalin that's ever existed. Um, and particularly, he criticizes the sort of psychobiographies and all of this uh, kind of the stuff that really psychologizes. But um, when I was reading some reviews, actually, of the book, I think one of the main criticisms that often comes up is essentially that he doesn't 
really do what he claims that he's going to do, which is to show how the how to try to show how like basically Stalin hardens as a person and how in some ways this period shapes, you know, his later life. And I think people make a good point that perhaps a lot of that hardening happens uh, during like the Civil War period from like 1918 until maybe 21, 24. Um, that kind of period, which isn't where this book goes. It really does cut off like as soon as the revolution um, takes place. And that kind of got me thinking of something that I had also talked about in our reading group, which is that I think more than, you know, analogous to any other uh, of the Stalin biographies that exist, I think that what Sunni's trying to do is much closer to the first Trotsky biography by Isaac Deutscher, um, where it's very sympathetic to Marxism. It's very sympathetic to the movement that's uh, that like created, you know, these two people or that was created by these two people and, um, you know, takes them very seriously, takes their ideas very seriously, takes their intentions very seriously. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, um, it's worthwhile having a biography of Stalin that like has that kind of contextualized perspective. So someone that's interested in learning about the period sort of in a holistic manner can have this like easy way in. Um, but that's also very like comprehensive um, and ha has you like learn everything that you would learn from like a really basic short history of the Russian social democratic movement before 1917. So what else do you think is like important about this uh, approach? Like I want to most, mostly focus on um, Sunni's approach, though I do think like, probably reading it, you know, like you learned not knowing anything probably about the Caucasus so much, how sort of the importance of the Caucasian revolutionaries um, and Caucasian is the Caucasus <laughs> for anyone who still gets that, you know, different wrong. Um, what uh, I think so it's, it's, he says, like, I wanted to really write about the Caucasus, but and but like I nobody would care about that. So I sort of named it Stalin and made it about Stalin. But it's really about showing the sort of incredible history of the Caucasian revolutionaries. Did that come through when you were reading it? Like, what are your impressions? Yeah, I think it absolutely did. Um, it definitely I think two two really strong points come through about um, the specific experience of like Georgia and the Caucasus in general. Um, I'd say the first would be explaining how Menshevism was so popular um, in the in the region and why those original republics, those basically Menshevik led republics in the immediate aftermath of the sort of revolution um, came to, came into existence. Uh, I think he does a really good job of exactly this kind of point of that kind of Menshevism in Georgia took up the mantle of the sort of default, uh, like nationalist um, sort of politics, but not nationalist in the sense that we would now think of now. And it really like showing that nationalism had this very socialist and like social character there. And I think it's an interesting kind of understanding of a different path that some nationalisms could have taken. Um, and I think that's interesting. And I think the other aspect that I think is that he does a really great job of, and I think if I was going to recommend that people read like any one section of the book, they you know, can't be bothered to read the whole thing. I think it would definitely be uh, the parts covering the 1905 revolution. Um, because I think oftentimes you get um, in most histories of 1905 and probably the most popular one is the Abraham Asher two part really long biography of or biography uh, story of history of 1905 revolution uh, is that it's mostly obviously focused on like Russia proper. Um, and because Stalin was in uh, like Tbilisi and in, and in uh, 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 Baku for 1905, for the most part, um, it does a really good job of showing exactly what that movement meant there. And uh, I think it's better than anything else I've ever written, read about uh, that. Uh, so I think that those are kind of the two really strong points of like um, sort of the context of Stalin that then you get to learn about like the movement more broadly and history more broadly from this biography. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was chapter 23, um, but like the chapter about the different ideas of, of uh, nationalism, what to do with sort of ethnic groups, where it's like everyone's position is highlighted from Lenin to Stalin to Jordania. Um, and like, I love that chapter myself because I think it does the best job of like highlighting differences, similarities between positions because it is so nuanced. It is like, it's, it's, 
they're like fine. There's a fine line between positions, you know, like you really have to understand the context to realize what is different about this approach versus that approach. And I do think it's like uh, the, all those nuances are completely lost, right? They're never the way nationalism has taken on sort of ethno state kind of stuff that we see with the nationalist movement in the in the early in the late 80s and early 90s here to also understanding it now like in support of israel as you know as a very ethno a national state um you know that that approach that the mensheviks had which actually in those debates even though i was like man everybody has really good points like it's so hard they're all like very like clearly everyone has like thought about this and had tons of experiences formulating these these opinions you know or these sort of lines yeah um, i wait i also think it's so easy um to go because the difficult thing with those lines is essentially that the sort of non-subtextual kind of things that they're saying like the things they're really saying on their face really don't seem very different and so you can have one type of um sort of lack of care going into writing a history of that where you say, oh, these like leftists were all squabbling over like minor differences. And then you can have the reverse of that where you have, you know, the implications that a lot of the figures at the time kind of thought that these would have. And you take those totally at face value. Um, and you say like, oh, just because the Mensheviks thought that the Bolshevik position was this and some of their rhetoric uh, you know, portrayed it as this, this must have been, you know, really what they were thinking. And in reality, I mean, it's always going to be somewhere in the middle. I mean, not to be a centrist, but oftentimes when it comes to like, what's really the, uh, you know, on its face, the obvious kind of things it's written, and then the implications are something that's like very historically difficult to judge. Um, and obviously, in using to you have the we now have the benefit of hindsight, but that can also be a drawback because you can try to say like, oh, you know, Bolsheviks saying that they should centralize that all just showed that how they wanted to have a one party state and all of this, which I think you totally can't uh, draw that kind of sharp conclusion based on um, total uh, hindsight. Yeah, even the smallest things have tons of consequences, as we also see today. Um, another thing that was besides like the various forms of nationalism and I actually felt like I was siding with Shortani in those, in those debates. Like I feel like he had much more, maybe like, again, it's, it is hindsight because we're now here in 2021. So it's easier to judge his position as being more correct than the, the second. Right. Um, so another thing that was really, really interesting, uh, was sort of the relationship between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks as being much closer. Um, also, as I said, in, you know, with Sunni, is like I realized how much the Mensheviks had taken on a lot of the Bolshevik uh, talking points, uh, um, talking points, reductive, but like you know, positions yeah. and also like tactics. So it was sort of like it made Bolshevism much more obsolete. Like it was, you could have, you could dispose of it almost here, you know is say you what you couldn't do in russia um and so because the mentions were you know so radically different there and so like i thought that was interesting but also the the line around um you know the uh, the role of the worker versus the intellectual was was like repeated a hundred thousand times in the book yeah. and i think it's so really really important yeah i think the thing that suni does where he very much stresses that like something that's often lost in histories of this period is that there's different types of intellectuals, basically. That the ideal type of intellectual, which I think comes across uh, well, like with Sunni, is exactly the type of intellectual that Stalin was. You know, someone that doesn't come from like an a uh, like a bourgeois family and isn't an intellectual in the sense that they, you know, fully like went to university. Obviously, because he was like a smart kid and had like these opportunities to go to the seminary and, you know, learn, he did grow into like a legitimate intellectual in the sense that he at least had like this high school education. Um, but he was what he was like, well read and yeah, educated himself in exactly in this way that uh, was like idealized by the uh, movement of the social democratic movement of this time. Um, he was really like, I, um, it's mentioned over and over again, but what they were always looking for is like, you know, a Russian Babel. 
you know, August Babel, who was um, one of the, who became basically the leader of the German Social Democratic Party, but who similarly came from a, a family um, of uh, basically like working class people. So. Uh, it's interesting because now having the Soviet Union for, you know, 70 years uh, and, and education was so formalized, everyone could get educated. So this idea of like self-educated revolutionaries and reading circles being an incredibly important part for not only learning new things, but consciousness and, and solidarity and so on, which we on the left still keep alive, right? Um, but it's really almost no one has experience with that anymore especially because it's not a revolutionary period, even though class struggle is at a very you know, um, bad for workers, right? On the losing end, there's almost no real like culture of that sort of self-education that was happening, um, which I loved how many examples Sunni talks about, giving like so many details to where they were meeting up, what they were reading, who was involved. I thought that was Incredible. Yeah, just the extreme you know? difficulty of it really comes across, you know, this idea that they would get like a pamphlet translated from German or something, and then they would have one copy of it. And then someone would stay up all night copying it out so that they could have it more than one person be able to read it um, at the same time and, you know, just be able to share it more widely. Um, yeah, and you, I mean, that's, it's, it's remarkable, you know. Yeah. And so I really, I appreciate, I really appreciate the book because it is about the, what I usually love, you know, especially if you're organizing anything, right. If you really need to know, not just like intellectually ponder about things, you really want to know what everyday life look like. Mm. It does an incredible job showing what the everyday look like. Like, what were they going through? What was their relationship even with their, their like families to how much they had to hide or move, move around the um, you know dangers surrounding every step yep. to said the difficulty in reading even language being a huge barrier um, yep. to all this. I think like to kind of make a final point that I was going to make um, regarding some of the responses to the book that I've read um, is the sort of criticism, yeah, that uh, they think that Sunni doesn't do a good job of really showing how like, you know, the seeds of Stalin's kind of paranoia and stuff would show up later. And I actually kind of disagree because I think um, the book does a really good job of showing um, like Roman Malinovsky and how he like was kind of constantly as this police spy present in this uh, in the upper ring of the Bolshevik leadership and how exactly it was Stalin, like Stalin's life was entirely shaped by the fact that this guy was just a spy the whole time and no one had any idea for years. Top Bolshevik leadership. He was the reason that Stalin was eventually arrested and ha spent these horrible years in Siberia that we, that we obviously read about um, when he was arrested in 1913, basically pointed out by uh, Malinovsky. And I think that that... Um, shows i think that that kind of shed, shed if you don't know the real like what the real consequences of that are i think it really does a good job of showing you like you know why obviously like the extent of the paranoia that existed later on probably was obviously um totally out of proportion but i think like the malinowski saga does do a good job of showing like one of the earliest kind of and strongest reasons for, you know, why, uh, like these people would have like very little like trust really. Um, and why they would have some reason to be, you know, not trusting. I don't know. I don't know if you thought about that, but. Well, I think like, I never really sort of buy into these whole seeds that then later on get like grow because like, I loved actually Victor Sturt's answer when they said like Bolsheviks, mm seeds of totalitarianism or dictatorship and he's like it had tons of seeds it also had hope mm -hmm. it had like you know like wonderful socialism communism that could actually been achieved yeah i love so that I quote as well and but I, that's my precisely my point is i think that like it it's definitely a criticism of all of these like psychobiographies that try to say like oh it's because his dad abused him or it's because you know something or rather and they're all like a bit i think they're all quite hollow um 
And I think that like, he doesn't eat, like the point with Malinowski, he doesn't, soon he does not make actually very strongly. But I think like just thinking about it myself, that's kind of one of the core um, points that I think I would make. Yeah, I think for me, I really like that he, like Stalin's trajectory was shown, right? From idealism, sort of much more hardened, you know, battle-tested revolutionary. So I, I like the arc because I think it does a good job of showing how people are shaped by experiences and they're not just this like born evil or good or whatever, which is another you know, very false way of understanding history or people, in my opinion. Um, so I did appreciate that a lot. And I think like it's, it's you know, it's, this podcast will go only an hour long. So it's hard to really discuss so many details and people have to have like um, some desire to really learn about all these sort of nitty gritty revolutionary details. Uh, it took us months to read the book and discuss it a few chapters at a time every week. So I would suggest everyone who's interested in this book, and I think you should be, um, you know, start a study group, read with your friends or people who may not be your friends, but you are interested in the topic, <laughs> like go week by week, go slow. But like it, it, it it really does go by fast the time and you do read the whole thing and it's actually incredible. Yeah, for sure. So, and I mean, I think often it's difficult to read a you anyone who's done a reading group on like a historical book, sometimes it can be a problem if you feel like um if everyone's new to the topic, it can be difficult to discuss a historical book because you just kind of say like everyone's just says, "Oh, wait, I didn't know that. Interesting, you know." But I think this book because it takes the politics of uh Russian social democracy so seriously, there's always a lot to discuss on the political end of things. Um, and I think I would definitely recommend it like that. And like I said, with like kind of the Deutscher Trotsky biography comparison, I think I would also recommend it to anyone that's um, sort of into Marxism, wants to know more about the history, of, like prehistory of the revolution, um, and wants to understand sort of this element of social democracy. I think it's uh, a really great entryway into that. I think it does a great job of like explaining some of those like differences that get explained in a very uh, one-sided way, often depending on what kind of literature you're reading. Thank you.